Ever since they first arrived on a cold, rainy late December morning in 2023, the Mark Vs have been building up anticipation for the next generation of SkyTrain cars. Fast forward two years and 2,000 plus kilometers of testing, the transit scene in Vancouver can say for a fact that the future is now. Hello and welcome back to the channel as we begin one of the most anticipated videos this channel has ever witnessed. In this video, we will be talking about the new Mark Vs and what this means for the Expo and Millennium lines going forward. If you are new to the channel, then please consider subscribing if you are interested in Vancouver area transit route and fleet updates. Now first things first, let's go ahead and address the big elephant in the room. So what are the Mark Vs? And why are these 235 new Skytrain cars making such a big deal in Vancouver? Well simply put, the Mark Vs are the new signature model for the Skytrain fleet. In late 2020, it was announced that Translink would be purchasing a record-breaking 205 new Skytrain cars in 41 sets to accomplish two things. One would be to replace the aging Mark I fleet which has been around since the 1980s, and the second would be to fulfill the fleet requirements to operate the Broadway subway when it is completed. This is the single biggest order for Skytrain cars in the history of transit in the city, blowing out the previous record of 114 cars placed in the early 1980s. In 2020, the cost of this contract with Bombardier cost 722 million Canadian. Eventually, Bombardier Transportation would go out of business and be sold to Alstom over in France. That would make these Mark Vs the first trains to be built by another manufacturer. However, the entirety of the manufacturing process would remain largely the same, staying north of the border. And 2021 would be the first time we would see a mock-up posted to Translink's Buzzer blog. This would also end up being the first mock-up in quite some time, as no mock-up was ever produced for the Mark Threes and second generation Mark IIs. And once the initial order was confirmed, Translink immediately got to work and started reconstructing the platform ends to accommodate the new trains. Some stations received Meyer Cosmetic Works, but at Waterfront, Gateway, and Royal Oak, for example, the emergency exits had to be rebuilt entirely from scratch in order to accommodate the longer trains. At 85 meters long, the trains overhang most stations by around 2 meters. Gateway and Joyce are two exceptions as instead their platforms are 90 meters long instead of 80. Regardless at the 80 meter stations, what matters is that the doors are able to open at the platform. And it was only at the end of platform reconfiguration that the new trains could begin mainline testing. At Broad Station, it was discovered that the tracks curved slightly on the west end of the platform. For that reason, this announcement plays on all Mark 5s entering Broad Station from either direction. Mind the gap and the exit the train. The platform reconfiguration will be complete by 2024, and the Mark Vs have been testing on the main line since then. Now also in 2024, Translink would go ahead and have the first option exercised. 123 million for an additional 6 sets 30 cars to operate the Langley extension of the Expo line. Funding for this was actually announced in 2021. This brings the totals to $845 million spent on 47 sets and 235 cars. Additional options still exist for replacements and expansion if necessary, which is crazy to think about since there could possibly be Mark IIs being replaced with Mark Vs if they get exercised. Now I'm just gonna put the options on screen right now, but go on over to the description if you want to have a look at more details. And after about 2,000 to 2,500 kilometers of mainline testing, the journey brings us to the grand reveal and open house of July 10, 2025. The set in the spotlight for all this would be none other than the third set delivered, 6051 through 6065. This particular set was spotted delivered at OMC2 in October 2024, so that marks about 9 months between delivery and entry into service. At the open house, the public was invited for a tour of Translink's signature Skytrain fleet of the future or current era, however you want to put it. And since we are early on with their entry into service, not many of you viewers have had the chance to ride the thing at all, since for most ordinary people, there are more important things to do than to camp out and ride a Mark V for a couple round trips. Starting with the end cars, we have the return of everyone's favorite hot seat, which is the captain's chair. Sitting on it, it does feel a bit far from the actual desk area. However, unlike the Mark IIs, the viewing angle is low enough to see the tracks in front without having to sit up tall. In front of you, there is this handle as well as this sticker for younger children to pretend and play. 
Looking up, we see a revised LED sign that reads off the train's destination. And moving back a bit, we can see these new half-width panels, and I presume that these are to make it easier for mobility aids to enter and exit the train. These next two features are probably the two most interesting ones that people have been raving on about. First is the LCD screen above the doors, which is the first on the SkyTrain network. These help out a ton in terms of wayfinding because now you get access to all the important information at once, such as system maps and a closer look at some of these major transfers, say at Broadway and Lougheed for example. And at least for now, there seems to be two different system maps. One displays the Canada Line and the other doesn't. And the one that does sort of implies that there is a through service from the Expo Line to the Canada Line when there isn't. That's my quick sidetrack and let me know if you think there should be a revision to the map. The other feature that is making a statement is the flex space in the middle of the lead cars. These have two leaning pads as well as a bicycle strap. Now they seem to have gone with these straps instead of this box thing for bike wheels according to the mock-up. And this is another upgrade compared to the Mark 3s, which only has a single handle at waist level. The multi-purpose area on the Mark 5s has additional functionality while still catering to basically anyone who needs it, whether it's someone needing to stand, a wheelchair, stroller, bike, you name it. As for the middle cars, they feature their fair share of design choices. The most eye-catching one by far has to be the return of sideways seating. You get five seats in a row against three column style seats in this configuration. Now on the Mark 3s, the closest thing I could find are sections with a 1-2 seating layout. Therefore, I suspect the change here was to turn the six forward seats into five sideways seats. Chanzling says that this was to create more aisle space. However, I would have liked to see them try doing a section where you have six forward seats on one side while having five sideways seats on the other side. That way, it's half of a 2-2 configuration where you're not compromising as many seats. Another thing that is of note is the side paneling near the doors, which feature these amazing artworks by indigenous artists. We had the commissioned Mark 1 up until recently, and now it's a great touch to have these as permanent fixtures on these newest train sets. And that's pretty much all there is to the interior. I don't even need to say that the new trains will be air conditioned. Now as for the total layout, you get 22 seats in the lead cars and 31 in the middle cars for a total of 147 seats on a Mark 5 train set. This is quite the steep drop off from 210 seats on a 6 car Mark 1 and a 4 car first generation Mark 2, but let's be real. In most other major cities, you can't even sit facing forward on the subway train. And that includes Mark 2 and Mark 3 variants over in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, where Rapid KL seems to have gone with four wider seats inside of five narrow seats on their full bench seating layout. That said, I disagree with two decisions. One is the decision not to include any additional ceiling straps anywhere inside the car. Instead of relying on people to hold on to a single bar between the seats, I would have liked to see additional straps hanging from above to get more people moving to the middle of the car. Second is that there seems to be some sort of allergy to using sideways seats in favor of single column seating. On screen right now, I have a quick Microsoft Paint sketch created off TransLink's diagram. I kind of went against the idea of having wider aisle space, but long story short, Expo and Millennium Line trains are a foot and a half narrower than the ones used on the Canada Line. Now, I'm no interior design expert, but if we replace the single seats with bench seating, we get an additional 6 to 9 seats per car for a total of around 172 seats instead of the 147 we have right now. That's an addition of 25 more seats on the train while avoiding a very narrow 2-2 layout. And despite having the multi-purpose areas in the end cars, my personal ideal layout would also be more seats compared to having bench seating throughout the train like in Kuala Lumpur. Let me know in the comments what you think of my revised seating layout. Now in terms of actual capacity, the Mark 5s are listed as having a top capacity of 672 passengers, which is subjective but in order to illustrate how significant this is when eliminating those older Mark 1s, there has to be some sort of number, right? Other than having a very blue exterior appearance, the Mark 5s on paper are really a rehash of the Mark 3s. This has led some to comment on TransLink's profound appreciation of the Mark 3s. If the Mark 3s were so perfect, then there shouldn't be much change when it came to the next type of rolling stock. And looking at the front of the train, we can see that they hit the back of the net with the shape of the headlights. Now let's talk about that very weird numbering system. This is the first time that SkyTrain is using a 4 digit system, and there's a very specific way of how it works, and I think this is how Bombardier and Alstom were able to achieve a 5 car setup. 
First is that the last digit is actually a suffix for the car's position on the train. Cars ending in 1 and 5 are end cars, while cars ending in 2, 3, and 4 are middle cars. And for this reason, you will never see a car ending in 6, 7, 8, 9, and 0. Second is that for every train, there is an identifier that follows the married pair system, which is required for the automatic train control system, aka the computers which control the train. On the Mark 5s, these are identified through the first three numbers of the car. In the case of the first train in service, we have 6051 through 6065. If we take the first three digits, we end up with 605606, which is the notation in which the ATC needs to be able to identify the train on the system. This is also the reason trains cannot have different numbers in the lead digit, so for example 601 through 605 for one set and vice versa. That does not follow the married pair system required by the ATC. It's an obscure numbering system, but I'm sure it will grow on us as we start reaching into 25 or 30 sets delivered. And with that all out of the way, this is the part that everyone's asking about. What about now? What's gonna happen to the fleet now that we have new trains in service? How quickly will the oldest Mark 1s be retired? Well, in order to do that, we must reiterate the two main goals of the Mark 5 project, retire the Mark 1s and provide more service on the Millennium line. The Mark 1s are getting old, and that's pretty much a given, but let's take a look at how the Millennium line has been doing in the past few years. Right now, we can see that the major stations are seeing a 20 to 30% increase in boarding since 2022. Take for instance Coquitlam Central Station, which logged a 28% increase in boardings between 2022 and 2024. Up the line in Brentwood, annual boardings have pretty much skyrocketed, going up almost 36% since 2022. This is largely due to the completion of the outdoor mall and established connections to bus services to BCIT and beyond. Case in point, ridership has been increasing on the Millennium Line, and that is without any major increase on the Expo Millennium Network since the last of the Mark 3s went into service almost 4 years ago. Now yes, there are other factors such as the supposed slower rate of delivery. In 2020, it was suggested that one set would be delivered every month beginning in 2024, and having a look right now, TransLink only has 5 sets in its possession. In fact, the most recent delivery only took place a couple weeks ago, so unless there was a reason to assume that deliveries were temporarily halted due to preparations, it would be extremely detrimental to ridership if they got on with outright retirements of the Mark 1s. Now how fast both of these objectives are completed is anyone's guess. Let's not perform any more mental gymnastics than we need to. That said, OMC3 which is along the Evergreen extension over in Coquitlam, did receive some minor capacity upgrades which were completed several months ago. Another small preview happened earlier this year in fact. Because of icy conditions, they opted to run the Millennium Line in 4 car sets. At every 6 or 8 minutes, the frequency wasn't bad per se. But in my opinion, that's not a service level I would consider operating during peak hours. My guess is that you'd need to bring in 5 or 6 more 4 car sets to get that frequency down to every 5 minutes or 12 trains an hour. And after that, I seriously doubt you can do much since they're really strapped for space at the main yard at Edmonds. Now can you run 4 car Mark 1s instead? Well, I suppose. It has happened in the past and is a middle ground solution compared to running 2 car or 4 car Mark 2s. But then again, the Mark 1s are very old. I will miss the flexibility on the Mark 1s when they are gone though. And I'm saying this because ideally, you would get better service with 3 4 car trains compared to 2 6 car trains. So the thing that needs to happen right now is that the Mark 5s need to start coming in on time. Looking at how they want to open the new yard and the Broadway subway in the same year, I have serious doubts that they'll be able to stock up on additional trains in time, especially if they're delivering one train every 3 months. I am hopeful that deliveries will accelerate, but the plan right now is to revisit this video in about a year's time when more train sets go into service. But at the same time, I would not be surprised if the Broadway subway operates with 2 car trains every 4 minutes on opening day. And by this logic, there probably won't be any Mark 5s on the Millennium Line anytime soon outside of service disruptions. And even looking ahead to 2027 and 2028, there will need to be additional rolling stock needed for testing of the Langley extension of the Expo Line. So going with this prediction, it is highly likely that there will be Mark 1s lasting through 2028. 
With more than 20 kilometers of expansion in the next 4-6 to six years, expectations are sky high with the delivery of new SkyTrain cars. For the longest time, it was thought that 3 and 5 car formations were impossible due to the capabilities of the ATC system. But in 2025, engineers and technicians have made it possible. And now trains on the Expo and Millennium lines will be reaching their longest possible formation. This is the start of a brand new era, a revolution of sorts for the SkyTrain fleet. And although this transition from old to new is having a rocky start, I think the Mark 5s are truly something to be proud of.